Hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by Pallium Canada and brought to you in collaboration with the Division of Palliative Care in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. Uh, I think it's fair to say we're all living in very challenging times during this COVID-19 pandemic and having to make many changes to our personal and our work lives. In a blog on the website of the European Pad of Care Association, Dr. Daniela Valenti, a Pad of Care specialist in Northern Italy, um, a region that is being particularly hit hard by the virus, wrote, rearrange, rearrange, rearrange. For patients who are not or appear not to be COVID positive, she writes, reduce home visits only to cases that are not manageable by telephone. And I, and I guess by that she also means virtual care. And she stresses the importance of using PPE appropriately. With that in mind, Pallium Canada, working with many members of the Pallium community across the country, including palliative care experts and colleagues in the front line of care, will be running this and uh, several other follow-up webinars. I'm Dr. Jose Pereira and I'm Scientific Officer of Pallium Canada and also Professor and Director of the Division of Palliative Care, um, the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. Um, today's uh, webinar is entitled PPE in the Home and I want to stress from the outset that the discussion today is to share ideas about how to use PPE when doing a home visit when it is deemed essential and when the provincial and territorial criteria of when to use PPE have, uh, have been applied. And we will stress this a few times. And this is a discussion. We hope that this gets a dialogue moving and that we can continue improving the ideas that we will share with you today. Now for some housekeeping. So your microphones um, are muted. Uh, we've got several hundred people signed up so this is uh, amazing and, and, and fantastic. Please use the uh, question and answer function by way of the chat text um, at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit any questions or make any comments. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to, uh, to, to control. This session is being recorded and will be made available uh, for free um, on, uh, on Pallium Canada's YouTube uh, channel. I'd like to introduce our, or hand over to our moderator at this time, Erin Gallagher, and Erin will introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Erin. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. I have uh, my own family practice here, and I supervise lots of wonderful residents uh, here at McMaster, and I'm also a palliative care physician working in the community. I'd like to have our speakers introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Brian. Hello, I'm Brian Curley. Uh, I'm the medical director at Hospice Niagara, but I'm also a family physician with the Niagara North Family Health Team. And as you can see, I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine and the Division of Palliative Care at McMaster University, Michael DeGroote School of Medicine. And Brian, I wonder if you would uh, just mention the, the co-author, the guidelines that you'll be presenting today. Right, so um, Denise Marshall, uh, whose credentials are on the screen, Denise will probably say hello to you in one second, and also uh, Dr. Lana Tan, a palliative care physician at Kitchener-Waterloo um, and assistant clinical professor in the Division of Palliative Care at McMaster University. Denise, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, like Dr. Pereira, am a, a professor of palliative medicine at McMaster University. I'm the medical director of my local hospice, and I run a community-based palliative care team that serves small town and rural Niagara. And I, present, and I prepared 0.5% of this presentation, <laughs> so feel, feel thrilled to be included. Awesome, and we'll hand it back to you, Jose. Thank you. So um, in terms of conflicts of uh, interest, just so you know, Pallium Canada is a not-for-profit um, organization. We've been funded mainly by Health Canada over the years with contributions, program contributions. Um, there's also been recently funding from CMA, which has made, uh, made it a, a possible for Pallium Canada to put out a lot of its uh, LEAP online modules um, at such a critical time. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, we also uh, Pallium generates some funds by way of the registration fees for the courses, and that's what allows it to do its research and, and development and maintenance of programs. I am also a paid uh, member of Pallium Canada. Um, I serve as scientific officer. 
Um, and I believe that Erin, Brian, and Denise had no conflicts of interest to declare. We spoke about that just before going That's uh, live. Mm -hmm. Good. And our uh, next slide. Should be there. So the learning, oh, that's right. Yeah, there, it's appeared in mine now. This is a bit of a lag. So the learning objective. So upon completing this, um, this webinar, we're hoping that you'll understand that this discussion is specifically about those cases where a home visit is required and where the criteria have been applied related to whether PPE should be used or not. Um, should we des describe the various factors that go into deciding how we do this? Um, in a hospital setting, I would argue it's uh, complicated, um, but there are a lot of pictures out in the, in the hallways. There are the baskets outside the room, the baskets inside the room, the bags, everything's organized. You don't have to worry who's gonna get rid of the stuff. In the home, I would argue that it's complex and there are a lot of things that we need to consider. And this certainly came to the fore um, as Brian and, and Denise and Lana went through um, the different steps. So we're hoping that you'll come out with a sense of, of what it is, but also equipped with, with more knowledge and understanding of, um, of things to consider when doing a home visit and requiring a, a PPE. And we also hope that by way of this, you're able to help us further develop uh, these guidelines. This is work in progress um, as things change day by day. So please feel free if you can find any ways to simplify it without, uh, uh, without undermining the safety of patients and, and ourselves, please let us know. Now, so a, a few important things. So please ensure that you are acquainted with your regions or your province's guidelines on when PPE should be used. Please make sure that you also know how to, to don, um, in general terms, how to put on the gowns and in which order the gowns and masks, etc. cetera. Um, PPE is a precious commodity and we have to be stewards of it, but, but in a way that keeps us safe and also keeps our patients safe. We really want to stress the importance of virtual visits. Um, this is so important and a point that is highlighted by Dr. Valenti from Italy. Um, so again, the discussion today focuses on steps to consider once you've applied those criteria and you're going into the home. So we're living in a, in a, in a time of great flux and uh, as I watch the TV, I'm sure all of you do, uh, guidelines seem to be changing, information and knowledge about the virus seems to be changing minute by minute, day by day. So I think it's important to continue monitoring on an ongoing basis the um, guidelines being put out by regional organizations, by provincial ones and even national ones. And that also applies to, to, to this pr uh, process we're doing. Um, so please monitor the website of the Division of Palliative Care um, at McMaster. The, uh, uh, the URL is on the screen because we may change these and we may be changing it as we go along, particularly as we hear from you on how to improve it. The important thing here is as stated by Dr. Michael Ryan, who is executive director of the WHO Emergencies Program, um, recently wrote, speed trumps perfection in any pandemic. So we wanna get this out there with the understanding that we will fine tune it as we go along. So please help us with that process. Now, the process of developing this uh, started with the division of palliative care being approached by many different people, including its members, to say, listen, we need some specific instructions. Our provincial guidelines are telling us when PPE should be used and not be used, but there are no specific guidelines on how to use it in the home. So we, we, we convened a group led by Brian that included Denise and Lana and Erin, um, and they've done an enormous amount of work uh, addressing this, looking at all the provincial um, uh, guidelines. Now, this is a national broadcast, so we obviously looked more closely at the Ontario guidelines. So please become acquainted with your guidelines, whether you're in BC or Nova Scotia or, or up north or any other province or territory. Um, we also held a webinar um, and from that webinar came some, some further input, and we've since then made some modifications uh, to these steps. 
All right, so I'm going to take over from this point. Thank you very much, Jose, for an excellent introduction and to really give some good, clear context of where we're coming from. Um, good, clear context is important, and I think that's where we're going to start today because we all come in here with different experiences, having read different guidelines, having different uh, people that we're seeing in the home. And, you know, I'm going to ask you first, Denise, if you could do me the favor of trying to set the stage for us and define exactly what the issues are that, that we're facing out there in the community visiting homes. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, I, I mean, what I've been trying to do is, is hear what physicians are talking to me about and all of our many pandemic planning tables, um, trying to hear what I'm uh, I think uh, physicians are engaged with around PP in the community. And I sort of framed it as a who, who, what, where, when, why, how, <clears throat> to, to sort of see what, what's on people's minds. I think physicians I'm talking to are already well down the road of understanding how to do some sort of <clears throat> local or regional approach and an algorithm or grid to distill down <clears throat> when this is absolutely necessary. So I, I see that that's underway. The idea of that you would be going in the home needing PPE it, only when that's sort of distilled down to an absolute need. So I, I think most physicians are engaging in these processes of figuring out who that patient is they need to see. Um, I, like you've said, Dr. Pereira and, and Aaron, mm -hmm. physicians are diving deep into their local, regional, provincial, national protocols. In Ontario, you know, it's the Ontario Health one, the Public Health Ontario one, the hospital system ones they're all referenced. So I think that they're getting a really clear idea of the PPE guidelines. So that seems to be well in hand. I, I think what I'm hearing from physicians is they realize that they have to be going into the home, if it's distilled down to that after all of the good algorithmic work, that they're not going to have a buddy. They're often going to be going solo. And so it's, it's, it's sort of become a, an issue of needing some guidance on the logistics in that particular setting. And that's predicated in all the good guidelines. And, um, and that's what they're hoping to hear from Brian today is knowing they likely won't have a buddy out there. Uh, they're going to be going on their own into the home. So it's a logistics thing. I, I think, again, I'm hearing from physicians, as Dr. Pereira said, they want to be good stewards of P PPE. They want to, um, to be using this just when it's needed to be used in a way that makes them safe, but being good vanguards of this precious resource. So it, it's kind of like where it's in the home <laughs> and uh, how uh, the logistics of that, that they're saying to me is kind of the unmet need that they, they want to use to complement the other guidelines. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for summarizing that. And Brian, I'll bring it to you, you know, in, in the midst of all this, all the questions, all the confusion, you know, what kind of responses have you seen from a local level to, you know, a national level in response to these? Well, Aaron, there's been a lot of, uh, of talk about uh, things like, why are we even doing this? We can't get the PPE in the first place. And I recognize that. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, this webinar is not going to address the issues of supply and demand for PPE. And also the issue, uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, that a physician, if possible, should be doing a virtual visit. But I think there are situations where we need to go to the home. And, but I'd also like to say here, I'd like to give a shout out to our nursing colleagues and PSWs who may not have the option of doing a virtual visit and may have to go to the home to do various things and perform various procedures and look after their patients and give medications. And so I think this, uh, I think this stuff applies as much or maybe more to them um, as, to, as it does to physicians. And I'm going to spend some time uh, in a few minutes talking about a bit of decision making and preparation for the visit to maybe sort of clear up um, why we would uh, why we would do the things that we do and and how we kind of make that uh, that call that we need to go to the house. Uh, I guess the other thing to say is that as Denise has already said, things are changing daily, um, and uh, now we're talking about uh, perhaps cloth gowns instead of disposable gowns. And this protocol doesn't really address that issue because it didn't really come into my mind until this morning. So I think it's going to be, as, as has already been said, a work in progress. We may have to, uh, as supplies of PPE change, as we start to reprocess things like masks and, and, uh, and other parts of our, of our PPE, we might have to develop this protocol a bit further. But, you know, today it is what it is. It's sort of the best we can do at the moment, and we just wanted to get it out to folks. 
Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for, you know, calling out many of our community colleagues who are doing a, a great deal of this work. I think, you know, Jose, Denise and I would second, third and fourth that. Uh, you brought up a, a point about some novel strategies like cloth gowns and things like that. You know, Denise, what kind of creative solutions have you heard through the grapevine or even seen yourself in response to this PPE crisis? Well, I think all sectors of society, not just healthcare providers, but <clears throat> our hospice uh, colleagues, volunteers, are all keeping their eyes peeled to uh, um, any sort of standards that are being articulated around how to make gowns and what standards they uh, they they uh, can be made to. And the same with the mask uh, situation, as you know. So I, I guess what I'm hearing is a lot of interest across all sectors and ensuring that if we're going to be making things, we're making them to some sort of specs and we're using them judiciously. And, um, and as Brian said, really plugging into the reusable aspect of everything. So if we have masks that meet code and standard, if there is a way to repurpose them, if we have gowns that can be washed, are we thinking about that and not just disposable? So I think, Erin, it's just the spirit of everybody is engaged on trying to share information on reusable and best practice of, of that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So speaking of best practices, you know, Brian, you've been able to develop with your colleagues here uh, a protocol of your own that is taking into consideration all of the caveats that we've already discussed today. And I'm going to hand it over to you to start uh, discussing your protocol in detail, encouraging anybody who is on the chat function to send us your questions that we will do our best to try and field out throughout this webinar. Uh, there's, as Jose said, hundreds of you on the line. So there's a lot that we won't get to, but we can certainly brainstorm some mechanisms for that after this webinar today. So thank you for your continued engagement. And Brian, I'll hand it over to you. Right, thanks Aaron. So we have about an hour total for this. So we've got about 42, 43 minutes left. And I think my uh, presentation here will take maybe 20, 25 minutes. So that should leave us time for some good discussion afterwards. So folks may want to sort of submit questions as we go and Aaron will collate them and then maybe fire them back at, uh, at those of us on the panel after we're done. So I'm gonna start by saying what has already been said numerous times, but it's worth saying again that this procedure really, <clears throat> excuse me, is intended to allow a healthcare worker to make a safe home visit to a patient with respiratory symptoms. And when I say respiratory symptoms, I'm thinking of uh, not shortness of breath from lung cancer, but I'm thinking of potentially infectious respiratory symptoms, the kind of patient who may or may not have COVID-19. And as a family doctor, I'm fielding calls all day long from patients who have a cough, maybe a bit of fever, um, achiness, sort of flu-like symptoms, and do they or don't they have COVID-19? And so there are a large number of patients, as you know, in that group, and we can't test them all. So we really have to be able to be safe um, if we need to go into the home for a particular reason, and that reason mainly will be to do a physical exam in most cases, but not necessarily for our nursing colleagues who will be going into the home to actually treat people. But um, we are not going to know whether a person with respiratory symptoms has COVID-19 or not. So we've got to protect ourselves. But what this is not is a protocol for visits to lower risk patients. And that would be situations where the patient and everyone in their home pass screening. And you know what I mean by screening, verbal screening, over the phone screening. Uh, they don't have a cough or a fever or any other symptoms. They haven't traveled. They haven't been in contact with anyone. So everyone in the home passes that kind of screening test and you've got to go in for some other reason. Um, and I think these kinds of situations and what I would have called in the next bullet point, lower risk situations. Um, I think you've got to consider what uh, degree and amount of PPE to use. And this may vary according to local protocol, and it also may vary according to what elements of PPE you have available to you. So at a minimum, it may be mask and gloves. Uh, it may also include eye protection. It probably doesn't include a gown if the situation is lower risk. But that may vary depending on where you are and what your local protocols are. Um, now, I put on this uh, that it is assumed that the provider knows how to correctly don PPE. Um, but 
maybe that isn't true because we've gotten a lot of questions over the last little while about uh, how do we actually put PPE on. Well, a lot of references at the end of this uh, PowerPoint that you can use. There are a lot of local, regional, national, and international protocols for donning and doffing PPE. <clears throat> and I think um, I would say as an editorial comment, provided that you get the PPE on correct when you're finished, um, the order can vary depending on where you are. Usually, usually it's gown first, then mask, then eye protection, and then gloves. But I've seen protocols that do that in a different order. Again, if you get it all on and every part of your uh, exposed skin at the front of your body is protected, then that's going to be okay. I think one little quick comment to say is no gap between the gloves and the cuff of the gown. The gloves have to go over the cuff of the gown. So that's about all I want to say about donning a PPE. I'm just going to now sort of try and go into the the rest of the presentation and what this is about. So I think as much as possible, you want to prepare for this visit with a virtual visit or a telephone call prior to going to the patient's home. Um, and you're gonna do your, your history taking and as much discussion as you can over the phone or on a video chat so that really your main reason for going to the home is to do a physical exam. And that's probably all you're gonna do while you're in the home. This will minimize the amount of time that you have to spend in the home and I also think it would be good if you could try to ensure that a family member will be in the home. Most of the time, I think that's the case, but perhaps not all of the time. But a family member in the home can be very valuable to you in a number of ways, particularly helping you to exit the home safely afterwards. In your preparatory phone call or video chat, um, I want you to ask the family member to do a few things for you. They should put a large garbage bin, now large is a relative term, in my house the largest garbage bin is not that large, uh, but a, the largest they've got garbage bin lined with a garbage bag just inside the front door and that's for you to put your disposable PPE in as you leave. <clears throat> if they have a surgical mask, and by that I don't mean an N95, I mean an ear loop mask or nobody has tie up masks anymore in this situation, they're almost all ear loop masks now, but if they have one, and some homes do, ask them to put it on the patient uh, when you arrive there. And if they have hand sanitizer in the house, ask them to have the patient do hand hygiene when you arrive. And this will lessen the risk of the patient transmitting something to you. Also in preparation, you're going to print two copies of the Q sheet on doffing PPE and we'll make that available to you. Um, and it basically just is a quick reference cue sheet with all of the steps for getting the PPE off safely that we're about to cover uh, in this presentation. You need two copies of this. One is gonna go outside the door of the home and one is gonna go inside the door of the home. And that's gonna be part of your kit that you will take with you. And in the next bullet is the contents of the kit. You're going to bring a container of alcohol-based hand rub that's too long to type numerous times. So it's ABHR, alcohol-based hand rub, which is 60% ethanol or more. So you're gonna bring that, a container of viral wipes, a green garbage bag, and a small plastic grocery bag, the kind that they won't give you for free anymore at Canadian Tire, for carrying everything or anywhere else, everything into the house. So um, this is gonna be a handy little, a little uh, thing for you and you will probably leave it behind, you will leave it behind uh, after your visit. You also need two empty pails, one is labeled clean, and one is labeled dirty. And uh, I got some very nice, uh, I believe they're 12 uh, liter pails uh, with a lid at the uh, local uh, home supply store, the one with the uh, orange logo. And uh, a lid for the dirty pail is ideal. You don't really need one for the clean pail. So two pails, dirty and clean, uh, an extra ear loop mask for the patient in case they don't have one. And, uh, and then, as I've already said, two copies of that uh, cue sheet for doffing PPE. So you've got your preparation done. You arrive at the home. You put the PPE on outside the home. Maybe it's in the back of your car. Maybe there's a carport or a garage uh, before, you empty the before you enter the house where you can do this. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to leave the empty pails just outside the door that you're going to enter and exit with the lids off and you're going to put the so-called clean pail closest to the door because you need to access that from inside the house. 
you're going to put one of those cue sheets on the ground next to the pails and you want to secure it so that it doesn't blow away. So you might uh, put the uh, pails sort of over the edges of the paper or put a paperweight or a rock or something on it so that it doesn't blow away. And you're going to enter the home carrying the little grocery bag and in that grocery bag will be the bigger green garbage bag, the viral wipes, the uh, hand sanitizer, the spare mask, and whatever equipment uh, you are going to bring with you. Uh, so here's another point that we've been hearing a lot about uh, lately. What equipment should we take into the home and what shouldn't we? And we've heard everything from I have to take my, uh, my um, pulse oximeter with me to why would you even bring a stethoscope? But I think, you know, whatever equipment you bring, you have to think about how you're going to carry it and how you're going to clean it. So I'll leave that uh, up in the air for you folks to think about, depending on what your role is and what your profession is. Just a note to say that the personal protective equipment that we want to use in this scenario, because this is the home of someone with a respiratory illness that may or may not be COVID-19, will be the gown, the mask, um, and it's a surgical mask, ear loop mask, unless there are aerosol generating procedures in the home. And aerosol generating procedures are considered suctioning of secretions, CPAP, BiPAP, or high flow oxygen. There are others, but they don't really apply to a palliative care home visit. If those kind of things are going on in the home, I'm thinking of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis who are on large amounts of oxygen. Uh, in those situations, you are supposed to use an N95 respirator, uh, provided that you can get one. Um, and the other thing, of course, is eye protection. And that can take the form of goggles, a visor, or sometimes a mask with an integrated uh, little visor piece stuck to it, and also your gloves. And we have a, a, a relevant question just to that slide, somebody sure. asking, what, what, is, um, what is high flow O2? Well, um, I've, I've seen different uh, definitions of this even on a, uh, a, a chat that we were on this morning. Uh, and I think, uh, Denise, maybe you can jump in and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen more than six liters per minute and I've seen more than 12 liters per minute. Yeah, in Ontario, I know we have folks outside of Ontario, but <clears throat> the best guidance I've been able to get is, is what's listed on our Ministry of Health COVID website that says 60% um, oxygen or greater. Um, I am recommending that people work with their community oxygen suppliers because there's the liter flow per minute and then there's the various masks people might have. But as a blanket statement, our Minister of Health is saying 60% uh, or greater uh, oxygen concentration ha has a risk of aerosolizing. Okay, thanks for that. I, I'm not an expert on this, but I suspect it might be different if it were a venti mask versus nasal prongs, where the flow is sort of straight into the nostrils, but I don't know that for sure. So thank you for that. All right, so um, with your little, um, little uh, bag uh, with all the equipment in it, you're going to go into the home. And remember, once you've got your PPE on correctly, for the moment, you're safe and you can pretty much touch anything that you need to touch because as soon as you're in the home, pretty much everything you're wearing in terms of PPE is considered contaminated. So in the house you go, you're going to take the uh, garbage bag, the bigger green garbage bag and not open it, but lay it out flat on the floor to make a little workspace. So open it up and uh, make it into an area that's uh, maybe a couple of feet in diameter and put it on the floor next to that big garbage bin. And this is your workspace to put your viral wipes, your alcohol-based hand rub, and the second copy of the doffing PPE cue sheet on it. Now you don't need that little grocery bag anymore. You can toss it into the garbage bin. So now uh, you're going to go to the patient to do your physical exam. Um, if the patient has not already put on an ear loop mask, you've brought one with you and uh, you can put, uh, give that to the patient to put on. And um, if they have uh, their own alcohol-based hand rub, they can do hand hygiene. Don't give them yours for this purpose. Yours is left at the door on that little workspace on the green garbage bag. So that's by way of safety, and then you can do your physical exam. So that much is pretty easy. PPE on, lay out your workspace inside the home, go to the patient, safety measures if you can, and do your physical exam. And this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. 
we have to get out of the house safely and get our PPE off. Uh, some of it we're leaving behind, some of it we're taking with us, so how are we gonna do that? So the first thing is, while you've still got your full PPE on, you're going to move to the front door. Step one, perform hand hygiene on your gloves with the alcohol-based hand rub. So you're gonna do hand hygiene, but it's really glove hygiene. And remember, as soon as you touch that bottle of alcohol-based hand rub, you've contaminated it with your dirty gloves. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So you've done your glove hygiene, and now you're going to take one of your viral wipes and you're gonna clean the inside door handle. I'll come back to this point in a little while. Now, cleaning of uh, hard surfaces with uh, viral wipes should be done twice with about a minute or more in between. So the procedure would be clean the inside door handle, wait a minute or so, and then repeat it again. And I've said on there with a second wipe, but it's only a minute. Your first wipe is probably still good. There's no point in wasting these things. They're a scarce resource as well. So as long as it's still wet, the door handle gets a second wipe, but you're not using a second sheet of wipe. You're just gonna use the same one another time. Now you've cleaned the door handle and it's going to be your point of contact for getting out of the house. So when you open the door for the next steps, you will touch only the cleaned door handle. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take a viral wipe and clean your stethoscope and anything else that you might've brought with you, such as that pulse oximeter. And then you're going to clean the bottle of alcohol-based hand rub because remember you contaminated that when you did your glove hygiene. And then you're gonna clean the viral wipe container one at a time. And I've run this scenario a number of times and what seems to work best is clean the stethoscope, open the door, put it in the clean bucket outside. Clean the other equipment, open the door, put it in the clean bucket outside. Clean the hand rub bottle, open the door, put it in the bucket outside. Clean the viral wipe container, open the door, put it in the bucket outside. There are so many different arrangements of front doors, whether a door will stay open, whether there's a screen door, a storm door on a spring, whether you may have somebody there to help you. So we're trying to make this self-sufficient for one person to do it. Um, there's video coming and you can see how I do it on the video and we'll talk to you about that in a little bit as well. But the point is each of these items in that order needs to go outside the front door uh, into the clean bucket and the only thing that we can touch while we do that is the cleaned door handle. Now again uh, the front door of a house with a spring-loaded storm door on it might be different than say an apartment door. So just kind of keep those kind of things in mind. The other thing to say is, although you've already put it outside in the clean bucket, it doesn't want to be at the very bottom of all the other equipment. The alcohol-based hand rub container needs to be accessible because you're gonna to need to use that a few more times. Okay, so where are we at? We've cleaned all our equipment. We've got it outside the front door into the clean, so-called clean bucket. We're still in the house at this point, still in our full PPE. So now we've got to undress. Now, here we go. There are a gazillion, and believe you me, I've looked at all of them, procedures for doffing gown and gloves in various different orders. So I would say to you, follow the procedure that you're familiar with or the procedure that applies to your local region. Um, and you can look online for a number of these and there are some references to a number of them um, at the end of this presentation, but you have to get your gown and gloves off safely without contaminating your hands while you do it. Uh, me personally, I like the technique where gown and gloves come off together as a unit and uh, that can be that'll be demonstrated in the video when we get to the point of putting the video up for you. One thing is when you get your gown and gloves off, you put them in the garbage can. You don't push down on the stuff in the garbage can. We have a tendency to want to shove stuff to the bottom of the can to make more room. Don't do that. There's some evidence, particularly in the more, uh, what would the word be, aerosolizable viruses. I don't think this applies to COVID-19. But uh, what you will find is if you shove stuff down to the bottom of the garbage can, a big puff of air comes back at you and there's a risk of potentially aerosolizing virus. So don't push it down, just drop it in and leave it there. Now, wearing only your mask and eye protection, you're going to exit the house. 
You're going to leave behind the green garbage bag on the floor. You're going to leave behind the doffing PPE cue sheet that you've been looking. And again, you're going to touch only the clean door handle. The first thing you're going to do when you get outside the house is hand hygiene. Now, this kind of fits with the procedure that you'll find in most, but not all, uh, isolation rooms in a hospital where the uh, contaminated gown and gloves are left in the room and sometimes the eye protection, but we're going to repurpose our eye protection here. Um, and so you exit the room then wearing your mask or your mask and goggles. And then the remainder of that stuff is dealt with outside. So that's the protocol that I have incorporated into this. And there are a whole bunch of reasons behind that. And believe me, I've thought about all of them. What should be done where? And I think this works best. And we can have some discussion later on about that if you like. So you're outside the house, hand hygiene with the alcohol-based hand rub before you do anything else. And now it's pretty much just like any kind of isolation room procedure. If you're wearing goggles and a separate mask or you're wearing an eye shield and a separate mask, you remove the goggles or the eye shield and you have to do it touching only the most posterior parts of the arms of the goggles, the parts that go over your ears or the posterior part of the headband or the eye shield. And you're going to take that and you're going to place it in the empty dirty bucket, which is the one that's further away from the door. Next comes the mask. You remove the mask by touching only the very back part of the ear loops, straps or ties or however it fits onto you. And now a couple of options. So when I first thought about this protocol, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was a family member that could help me out here and I could potentially hand that mask back into the house for somebody to put in the garbage. But as you can see from the asterisk, doing that kind of violates the two meter distance rule between yourself and anybody else. But maybe you can envision a scenario where there's a storm door and the patient is inside the house behind that storm door with only a hand sticking out the door and you can hand off your mask holding only the ear loop and they can grab it and they can take it inside and throw it in the garbage. If you don't like that plan or if there is no such family member or if the way things are going now, we're talking about saving masks and potentially reprocessing them, then you're going to either throw the mask in the outside garbage if there is one, but probably better in the dirty bucket along with your goggles. And then you can take it back for reprocessing. So I think maybe if I had this slide to do again, based on discussion that we had this morning, I might eliminate that outside garbage can idea. And I might think about taking my mask with my goggles in the dirty bucket back to my reprocessing area and thinking about whether I should save it in case technologies come along in a few weeks where we could actually reuse that mask. So think about those things as well. Next step. Yep. Ryan. Yeah. Sorry, if I could just interrupt for a second. There's sure. a, a question that's come up specific to the protocol. So I want to ask it while it's relevant. Sure. Um, when you have your medical equipment in your hand and you wipe it down with a viral wipe, have yes. you not contaminated the hand that was holding the equipment? Uh, no, you've done glove hygiene first. So your hand is clean and then you've taken the wipe and you've wiped your, uh, you've wiped your equipment. Um, and uh, no, I don't think that's the case. And then you uh, basically take your, your equipment and put it outside straight into the clean bucket. Um, I think because you have, uh, well, okay, I, I see the point. So you're, uh, yeah, you're holding a piece of dirty equipment with your, with your glove. Okay, uh, but I think you, th there's a couple of things about that. You're gonna do a second wipe on all your equipment when you get it back to your reprocessing area. So um, that should take care of that issue. And obviously we have to be able to, uh, to clean our equipment before we leave the house. So I don't think there's any other way around that. It's a good point though, Aaron. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so, so let's go on. So now we have our, uh, our eye protection off and our mask off. Uh, and then again, hand hygiene. So now we can put the lid on the dirty bucket. Um, we are uh, not going to touch the goggles or the mask which are in the bucket. And this is why we want a lid for that bucket so that uh, you can put it in your car and stuff isn't going to fly around inside your car. And you're going to leave behind the copy of the Doffing PPEQ sheet. And I'm sorry, that's going to be a piece of paper litter but it's just one less thing to worry about. And then you're gonna pack your car. And now you've got to decide where you're gonna do your reprocessing of your equipment. So 
um, I guess it's going to be your home, your office, or your clinic, or somewhere where you can safely wash things. And when you get there, you're going to put uh, fresh vinyl exam gloves on, and then you're going to do this step of giving all your equipment a second wipe. So that should look after the question of, you know, did you contaminate your gloves when you picked up your stethoscope? And then are you contaminating a little bit all of the other pieces of equipment uh, uh, as well when you do it? This is the, probably the reason why a second wipe is really critical. So this is like vinyl exam gloves, not the, not the good uh, long cuff nitrile gloves, which if you can get your hands on those, or maybe I should say get them on your hands, uh, would be the ideal thing for actually using with your PPE. Uh, something cheap and easy, because this is for the purposes of washing and reprocessing. Mm -hmm. So you give your equipment a second wipe. You still have your gloves on. Now, if you've got the mask in the dirty bucket, if you brought that back with you, um, put it in the garbage or if you want to think about saving these masks up for potentially future uh, reprocessing, then put it somewhere safe uh, so that it can be uh, reprocessed later if the technology arrives. Mask now is out of the dirty bucket. Goggles are still in there. You're gonna put some dish soap and water carefully in the dirty bucket. You don't want the water and dish soap to splash up onto your face or in your eyes. So gently put some water in the bucket. Um, or if you have, uh, you're fortunate enough to have a second pair of goggles, you might wanna put those on while you're doing this step. So you're gonna wash your goggles in soap and water in the bucket. Then you're gonna rinse them with water and then you're going to place them in a 10% bleach solution that you prepared beforehand. So that is one part bleach to nine parts water and soak. Now, your next question is, how long? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, I read a bunch of protocols on this. None of them sort of said how long to soak. I'm doing 15 minutes. I'm willing to listen to reason. I think 15 minutes is probably sufficient. Uh, in practice, you're probably doing other things while those are soaking, and you'll come back to them later on. So if it's a half an hour, I don't care. But I'm going to guess at least 15 minutes, but I'd be really interested if anybody has any experience with this and could tell us whether that's a reasonable, uh, a reasonable time. Um, so there you are. The dirty bucket is empty now. So you've still got um, you've still got dish soap and water in the bucket. So wipe it out. Uh, don't forget to do the lid of the bucket because it's contaminated, especially inside part of it. Uh, let it dry for a bit, or you could even potentially dry it with a paper towel. And then you're going to take a viral wipe and you're going to wipe out the inside of the dirty bucket. Also remember, and I remembered this when I actually ran the protocol a few times and realized that uh, after I'd taken that dirty mask out of the dirty bucket and put it in the garbage, the next thing I did was grab the bottle of dish soap. Oh, so I've contaminated the dish soap container now too. So I need to wipe that down with a viral wipe also. And when all of that is done, I can remove my vinyl exam gloves and then once again, hand hygiene. Ryan, just a, a quick question. You know, what are some of the benefits or the risks of using something like a bleach solution versus a, a wipe? So yeah, Aaron, thanks. That commonly asked question. Why don't we just cavi wipe the gloves or wipe them with a viral wipe? And I think the 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 issue is number one, uh, viral wipes are a scarce resource, and we don't want to use any more than we actually need to. Uh, number two, um, the type of uh, goggles that I'm talking about are the kind that fit over your own eyeglasses, but they kind of look like a big pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. and they have hinges on them, and it's difficult, and some of them have louvers on the side of them, such as the ones we have at the hospice, and it's almost impossible to get into those little fine crevices uh, with a viral wipe, and you could say exactly the same thing about a pulse oximeter. It has a hinge and a spring and everything in it, and so that is an issue, and you're certainly not going to throw a pulse oximeter into a bleach solution, but I think you can throw the goggles, or not throw, but place the goggles in the bleach solution after you've washed them with soap and water um, as a very safe way to completely disinfect them. And I didn't make that up. There is a protocol for that from Health Canada. And the, uh, the reference is attached to, to, this, uh, to this PowerPoint. So, so I, think that's, I think those are the sort of basic reasons why. Now, it might be different if you're using a shield, right? An eye shield with a headband that someone has 3D printed for you. Uh, you may be able to, to a viral wipe uh, the outside of the shield. Um, because it might be difficult to put that whole apparatus into a, into a bleach bath. Uh, you have to think about the headband part of it. Um, 
and uh, generally speaking, it'll be the front part of the shield that's contaminated. So the, the clear part that you look through, then you have to think about the headband. So if there's elastic on the headband, you can't really clean that. If it's a straight plastic headband, you may be able to take it apart and you may be able to soak that in bleach or cavia wipe it. But if it's got knurled knobs and lots of little uh, parts and holes and perforations in it, as most of them do, a bleach soak for that might be better as well. So those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, we've got a, a comment from uh, somebody who's listening in, Brian, saying that the 10 minute soak and bleach solution is pretty standard, so 15 is fine. This is the standard for sanitizing CPR mannequins, for example, which perfect. is a, a really interesting perfect. point. Yeah. yeah, perfect, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so in the interest of time, it's about quarter two, I'm gonna go on. Just wanna say a couple of final notes, um, and I've already said this, depending on the configuration of the front door of the house, you may need to modify your exit procedure. Uh, it would be really nice if there was a family member that could potentially hold the door open for you and stand outside of it behind the door. You wouldn't need to clean the door handle. You could go in and out freely with somebody behind the door protected uh, from you and you're protected from them by the door itself. Um, if you need to do multiple visits without returning to your reprocessing area in between, you might need to think about how you might modify this procedure. And, and this has been asked as well. Um, didn't think of this when you asked me the question earlier about, uh, about uh, things that we've been hearing in comments. Do you need another set of PPE for every visit? Well, you certainly need gloves and a gown for every visit. And I'm assuming that I'm talking about the paper disposable gown. And you're going to need to give your equipment that second wipe before you go to the next visit because, as we've said already, two wipes a few minutes apart. You're also going to need some vinyl exam gloves with you to do that, so you'll have to modify your kit a little bit. And you're going to have to do hand hygiene after you do that second wipe. So remember all of that. And we've been asked, is it possible to use the same mask and eye protection for several successive visits? And there was a document that uh, came out of uh, Public Health Ontario yesterday recommending exactly this. But the caveat is you can't touch either the mask or the goggles while you're not wearing gloves. So you've got to be sure that you can safely drive your car with a mask and goggles on or a face shield. And once they are removed, once you touch them, um, there's a risk of contaminating your skin when you took them off. And also when they're reapplied, there's a risk of contaminating your face. So the general rule of thumb is once you take off your mask or eyewear, you can't put it back on again. You got to put it in the dirty bucket to be discarded or reprocessed. So really that's the protocol. There are the references. Um, and uh, Aaron, I'll hand it back over to you to uh, tell us what sort of questions might have come in. Thanks, Brian. I'll, I'll ask a, a really specific one first. And somebody had mentioned that their understanding is that a bleach solution can lose effect after about 24 hours. Uh, wondering if you know anything else about that. I don't know for sure. I think that uh, chlorine, for instance, in a swimming pool is degraded mainly by ultraviolet light from the sun. So I'm not sure about the exact stability of the bleach solution. I've been doing mine at the office for several days at a time and then changing it. But if somebody really has good info on that, I'd like to hear it because if we need to change our bleach solution more freely let, let, or more frequently, let's know that. That would be a really good outcome from this webinar. Yeah, it looks like it's coming from the WHO site uh, okay. is, is what I'm seeing here. Good, so. if, good. That's great. If somebody's got a reference, Aaron, let's have it. Yeah, really great information. Thank you for contributing that, Sally. Um, okay, so, you know, let's take a step back. You know, we, every time I hear this protocol, Brian, I am just amazed by the amount of work that you and Denise and, and everybody has put into this. And I can only imagine how many times you have run through this in your head and how many times you have physically run through this. And I have to say, as somebody who, you know, has even heard it multiple times, there's lots of steps. What is your advice for people, you know, now that they have this protocol and they'll be able to have it in their hands, what's your advice to making sure that we're successful in using this? So I think the first uh, thing is the first thing that I said, prepare the visit with a phone call ahead of time. Make sure that you're only in there for the minimum amount of time, mainly just to do a physical exam. If you can put things in place ahead of time so that everything's ready for you when you arrive, it'll go better. Second thing, make up the kit. Make sure that all the things you need are in the kit, including some of those extra items uh, that I mentioned. Um, and the third thing would be run through the scenario a few times yourself. Um, and I did this when we were developing the scenario. 
um, with the resident that was working with me at the time, we actually sort of laid out uh, in, in our office at the hospice, this is the patient's room, this is the outside, this is the door, how are we gonna actually make this work? And we blocked it out. So run through it a few times, um, you know, using, uh, using uh, your equipment over and over again, practice putting it on, uh, practice going into the house, practice laying out your work area, practice cleaning stuff and putting it outside the door and exiting the house and taking off your mask and uh, taking off your uh, goggles and then taking off your mask, just the way I outlined it in the protocol. You don't want to do it for the first time at a patient's house when you're anxious and nervous. It'd be good to run it a couple of times ahead. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I know that if I were going into a home, I would want to practice this as many times as I could just to, you know, not have to be doing it on the fly, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, Aaron, Aaron, everybody says, oh, it's so complex, it's so complex. But and, and it looks complex when you look at the list of steps, but actually it isn't. If you do it two or three times, you sort of see, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I can do this. This is, this is not that hard to do. It's just basically the same steps that you do in an isolation room at the hospital adapted for a house where you've got a door in the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even, you know, there, there are going to be circumstances that we run into. I mean, even the fact that you just listed different types of doors, right, being right. taken into consideration, you know, right. a, people are still going to have to be on their toes yes. around what makes sense and what doesn't in the home, it sounds like. Um, a couple of questions have come in about, you know, what happens when things get worse, right? And, and I, I do think that this is probably beyond the scope of this webinar, but, you know, as, as this is spread around more in the community and what about even family members in the home that we know are probably higher risk for this type of thing? How do we know what PPE to use and what PPE to, to bring? Well, so I think, again, it goes to the preparation for the visit. You've got to screen people over the phone. You have to screen everybody that's going to be in the home, including the patient, uh, with all of those typical screening questions. And, um, you know, the reason for doing your, your visit is basically to examine someone, to do something that you cannot do uh, over a video chat or a telephone. Um, if a person is really... Uh, really getting sicker. Uh, once again, this is palliative care. So what do we do? Goals of care discussion. What would you want to do? Are you comfortable staying at home? Uh, and then do we have the community resources at the present time in your community to effectively care for somebody who may have COVID-19 who is really struggling at home? What would they think about going to the hospital? So, I mean, I don't have the answers to those questions, Aaron, but those are the considerations, right? Yeah. You know, and, and similarly, there's, there are other things coming out just saying, and, you know, I'll open this up to all of our panelists, including you, Jose, you know, is there a minimum standard right now for the amount of PPE that we should be walking into any home with? Waiting for the other panelists. You're asking if there's a minimum amount of PPE? Yeah. Yeah, well, I feel like that's an evolving and moving target to answer. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I could say that there's, I have one answer, Erin, for across Ontario and across Canada. Um, I, I, I certainly don't think it hurts. For example, hospices in Ontario have moved to all the staff wearing masks, you know, and gloves for whatever value gloves would have versus really good hand washing. So if that move has just happened in the last few days, that all the staff are wearing just regular surgical gloves for routine care, <clears throat> then it does beg the question. I mean, on my mind, of course, is, and I'm sure it's on everyone's mind, is just the, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, trying to make judicious use of limited supply. And are we at that point that every visit right. we need to have a mask or more? Um, that's, that's why I think we, we, don't, we don't have the answer for that. We're open to all these other tables that are chewing on the same issue. Um, yeah, it's a really it's a really tough question, and I think uh, I think my answer would be if it's a low risk visit, I'm probably going to wear a mask and gloves. Um, if it's a high risk visit, uh, I'm going to probably follow this protocol and do the full PPE. Uh, it would be uh, entirely an entirely good question to say, are you going to wear uh, eye protection for a low risk visit? Mm -hmm. And I guess that would depend on whether I could repurpose the eye protection if I've got a pair of goggles I can take back with me. Um, sure, I can do that. you got to think of what you're going to do with this stuff, though, when you get out of the house with it on. Yeah. Yeah, really good point as well. 
Somebody said to me today, I'm going, I'm going shopping. I'm going to wear a mask. And I said, well, okay. You might be better off to wear gloves rather than a mask unless you expect somebody to cough on you in the, in the grocery store. But if you wear gloves, because you're probably more likely to, to get it off of a surface, then what are you going to do with your gloves when you come out of the grocery store? Yeah. Take them off and throw them in your car? Yeah. Uh, Aaron, you asked me as well about the question. To be really honest, I really don't know. I think things are changing so much. All I can say is I know we've got hundreds of people across the country. Please link into your provincial guidelines and look at that. And, and it may just be a moving target. Yeah. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, and we hope that the efforts that are happening by our provincial governments, by the federal government, which I think they are really working hard at that to try to make sure that PPE is available for when it is needed. I, I'm hoping that comes through. I'm, I'm sure they're working really hard on that. Yeah. But just, just monitor your guidelines because I don't know how to answer that otherwise. Yeah. And, and monitor, monitor this document and this presentation because what are we at, version eight now, folks? Yeah. Something, like, <laughs> something like version eight. And 8. that's in 8.2. .2, and that's in the space of about mm -hmm. seven days, less than seven days. So uh, it's one of these sort of what did I get myself into things. Jose said, Brian, can you develop a protocol, right, for, uh, for PPE in the home? And wow, so this is what it's turned into. But it's going to change. It's going to change as we start to repurpose potentially masks. It's going to change as we move to um, multi-use gowns. Uh, it's going to change as eye protection changes. Um, so. Yeah. Well. Aaron? Yep. Can I, I know we're running out of time, but I was, I'm scanning down all the questions as they were coming. It was like amazing, by the way, amazing. <clears throat> I think there were like 36 questions, but three or four of them relate to the same topic, which is someone doing multiple visits or, or Brian, I guess I, I'm reading it to you, multiple visits and apartments that came up a number yes. of times. Can you address the, someone who's going from house to house? Cause I mean, for me, I might be in the luxurious position of only doing one visit, but do you have any recommendations on this stuff for multiple visits and the apartment situation? Well, um, I don't think you can come out of one apartment and go into another apartment without uh, changing your PPE. With the exception of um, mask and eye protection could be worn for multiple visits in the same apartment building. And I would recommend that as a way of conserving. Um, I guess my concern about multiple visits with the same mask and eye protection is driving the car between the visits and we've already addressed that um but i think you've i don't think you can run the risk of uh of wearing a gown and gloves for multiple visits um uh, potentially taking um uh contaminated gown and gloves into a person who doesn't really have covid 19 that would just be unacceptable and another question that was asked recently is why don't you just do the whole thing outside the outside the door why don't you just take the, the, the gown and the gloves and bring all your equipment out and clean it all outside the door. And the answer to that is, is simple. That would require leaving your alcohol-based hand rub and viral wipes sitting outside the door of an apartment, going in, closing the door. And what will you do 15 minutes later when you come out and it's not there anymore? Mm -hmm. Another layer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, just recognizing the time, we are going to have to close things up today. You know, I'll thank you and Brian um, and Denise so much for giving us your wisdom and expertise today. Uh, just really impressive work. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being so engaged in the chat and allowing me to ask some of your uh, very interesting questions. Unfortunately, we didn't get to all of them today, but uh, Jose is going to give you guys some information about where you can access more of this information moving forward forward. Thank you again. Thank you. Erin, thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thank Denise. Um, fantastic work. And thanks for the generosity of sharing this uh, with us. And I know in sharing it, obviously, since there's so much in flux, one's putting oneself out there for, uh, for, um, you know, for, for criticism. But I think people need to understand this is a moving thing and we're all in this together. So help us out. Let's fine tune this. Let's make this something uh, that can be used and is practical. Let's address gaps that may exist in, in provincial or national um, guidelines and do it together. Um, so th this has been recorded and it will be made available um, by Pallium. So you'll all be receiving uh, an email uh, with the link uh, to the broadcast so you can share it. 
it will there will also be a link on the Pallium website. So that's www.pallium.ca. Um, it will be broadcast on the Pallium YouTube uh, channel. Um, so at this point, I just want to wish you all uh, the best. Stay safe. Continue the fantastic work that everyone is doing. Look after yourselves. Take some time off. Take some time as well with the families if you can. Uh, obviously keeping that social distancing, but not uh, social loneliness. Make sure you're in, in contact. Stay tuned for upcoming postings uh, for more webinars. There'll be more coming up next week and probably the week after that. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.